this afternoon. Um, we have, some of us have been here throughout the day. We've had a worship service in the sanctuary earlier. Uh, we've transitioned to a luncheon as well. So individuals have come from lunch and we are excited about this presentation. All right. I'm Pastor William Lee. I am the pastor here of, of this particular church. I have the joy of being pastor uh, here at the Shiloh Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are in for a treat this afternoon. We're in for a treat this afternoon. And we look forward to the blessings and the mindset change as well as the physical changes as well that are possible for us all to live a healthy lifestyle. We recognize that we're in a church and we just want to just acknowledge God and to uh, thank him for all that he's done for us. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads if you would as we offer a word of prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, we are so thankful that it is your desire that we all would prosper and be in good health. Your word declares that you desire for us that whatever we eat or whatever we drink, that we'll do all to the glory of God. I pray this afternoon that you would bless us, bless the presenters. May all the technology and everything else has been set forth, may it come, come cl clear, and may we all be blessed and live healthy lives in 2020. For we ask it in your name, amen. At this time, I want to invite our uh, Shiloh's Health Ministries leader, our director, Dr. Christina Wells, at this time. Would you give her a round of applause as she comes forth at this time? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out today. It's a joy to see you on this first Saturday of the new decade. Um, I thank you for coming out. It has been a pleasure partnering with Kay and the National Vegetarian Museum um, for them to come out and just help in, to enlighten us and remind us of the importance of the food that we eat, not only for our health, but also for our environment. Here at the Shadow Seven Day Adventist Church, we believe in the importance of a healthy diet. We believe that God gave Adam and Eve a diet that was plant-based when he created them. And so it is our goal to promote health in everything that we do. Now, we're not perfect but we promote health in everything that we do. And so we thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, we have some exciting programs coming up. So, and we will announce those at the end. Uh, we're gonna be doing a vegan vegetarian cooking class with Chef T from, how many people know Majani's restaurant? Well, I have partnered with Chef T, and he's going to be coming here to do some vegan vegetarian cooking classes for us. So I'm going to give that information to you guys at the end so that you can sign up, so that you can apply the information that you learned today. Again, thank you for coming out, and I'm going to bring up Ms. Carmelita Banks. Good afternoon, I'm Carmelita Banks, a Southside volunteer for the National Vegetarian Museum. First, I wanna thank Shiloh, especially Pastor Lee for agreeing to host our exhibit, Dr. Wells for working out the details and selecting Dr. Mason's talk as a special event, and Ms. Norton for letting us in and keeping the display pockets filled with brochures and flyers. Amen. The church's health food store is open from 5 to 7, Wednesday and Thursday, uh, 10 to noon on Friday, and 11 to 2 on Sunday. It provides mostly frozen transitional foods at reasonable prices. Please call before you come. Next, I want you to know that at least two other museum events will be held on the South Side this year. For the month of April, the display will move to Whitney Young Library, which is on 79th uh, near King Drive where the special event will be a food demonstration. And for the month of May, uh, the display will, be, will move to Bessie Coleman Library, where the special event will have a representative from Imperfect Produce bring vegetables and tell about its program. And you can take the vegetables home. Okay. <laughs> uh, the museum would like to bring its story map to the South Side, but we need a location. 
We also are looking for more volunteers to help us at the different events and to help me recruit more sites on the South Side. Next, I want to make you aware of two vegetarian meetups on the South Side. Uh, Plant-based South Siders, which meets monthly to learn and eat together, and the Vegan Plant-Powered Adventure Group, which bikes, hikes, and cleans up grasslands in Chicagoland and beyond. Neither charges dues. Plant-based South Siders is no longer on meetup.com. Instead, announcements of coming events are on nextdoor.com and my informational blog, southchicagolandvegetarians.com. Today, we came to learn from Dr. Mason. Next month, we will eat at Good Foods Cafe during a weekday and time selected by those who signed up today. This is the meetups, oh, the, the meetups sign up sheet is back on the uh, register as you go out the door, right by the door. Um, uh, let's see, the next thing. Vegan and Plant Power Adventure Group lists and explains its events. Currently, there are two this month and one in February, and you can check them out on uh, meetup.com. Claudia Gunter, a new Chatham resident, is the facilitator. Lastly, I want to make you aware of uh, SouthChicagolandVegetarians.com, my informational blog for any kind of vegetarian, a newbie, a dabbler, a part-time vegetarian, a veteran, or a relocated vegetarian. The blog lists events, businesses, farms, markets, restaurants, monthly specials at restaurants, and resources downtown on the south and southwest sides, their suburbs, and northwest Indiana. I have brought business cards for those interested. If you would like to contact me about vegetarian specials or new places, my email address is carmelita at southchicagolandvegetarians.com. Thank you. Oh, I almost forgot. The, the uh, museum's brochure always lists the restaurants, the vegetarian and vegan restaurants uh, in Chicagoland. The ones for the south side are listed under south. Those in, that are listed far south are the suburbs, okay? Um, but they have it for the other parts of, of Chicagoland, too. So I just wanted to make you aware. If you didn't get one of these brochures, be sure and pick one up on your way out. Thank you. And now, with great pleasure, Kay is going to introduce the super one. <laughs> Thanks, Carmelita. So Carmelita is the museum's south side coordinator, and I'm grateful to her for connecting us to the Shiloh Church. Thanks, Carmelita. Um, I hope you all got the chance to see our museum in the lobby, and if you have any questions, you can ask me after Dr. Mason's talk. Our next event is a free screening of the documentary The Game Changers about some famous athletes who are now, who have now become vegan. Uh, we also have some whole grain, wonderful whole grain cookies outside uh, in the lobby, and uh, you're welcome to help yourself to them also uh, after Dr. Mason's talk. I know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is very friendly to vegetarianism, as one of its founders, Ellen White, was a vegetarian, and uh, she strongly encouraged the practice. Also, several studies have found that Adventists are significantly healthier than the general population, which is interesting. Our movement owes much to Seventh-day Adventists, since much of what is now known about the health effects of vegetarianism comes from their studies. The National Vegetarian Museum is here because our country is in the middle of a grave health, environmental, and ethical crisis. Eating a whole grain vegan diet is one of the most significant factors that can lead us back toward health and harmony. Our vision is a, of a healthy world in which both human and animal suffering are significantly decreased with all life and sustainable balance. 
Uh, after Dr. Mason's talk today, uh, I guarantee that you will want more of him. And it happens that I recently watched on YouTube the most wonderful interview that he did with Elizabeth Alfano, uh, which you can look up. Uh, in it, Dr. Mason quotes God in Genesis, telling us that plants and seeds are to be our food. We have that very quote in our museum, uh, on our ancient history panel. And Dr. Mason, in the interview, goes on to say that all of the animals that we kill for food then go on to kill us through heart disease and cancers, and that it's almost like revenge. Uh, he's, he's quite funny. I know you will enjoy him. It's a wonderful interview, and try to remember to watch it. Uh, it is thrilling to me that the COO of the Cook County Department of Public Health is smart enough to be a vegan. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Terry Mason. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Got to get my hug. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank you so very much. To the pastor of this church, you know, you, you can tell I'm brought up right. Uh, to the pastor of this church, Dr. William J. Lee and First Lady Latronia Lee? Latoria, see, I spelled it wrong, I'm sorry. And uh, to Dr. Christine Wells, thank, I want to thank all of you for the invitation. And also, I'd like to bring just brief greetings from um, Gar Pastor Garth Gabriel, who is the, the executive secretary for the Lake Region of, of Chicago, Seven Day Adventist. Okay, I get it right. Y'all can tell you can tell Garth. He uh, we known each other for a long, long, long time. He's like my big brother, although sometimes he thinks he's my daddy. <laughs> so I, I really want to. Um, say how much how much I appreciate being here and I'm going to ask the uh, I'm going to ask the AV people that they could sort of darken the stage for me because it'll help create better visualization of the of the slides so I'm going to go through this um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got to be here what I'm doing and all that sort of stuff and then some stuff about what and that's true what they said that I said when I was interviewing with uh, Ms. Alfano that I do believe that the animals are getting revenge by killing us, by eating them, because that's what's happening. So we're going to get right into it. So I always like to start the talk by paying homage to the real father of medicine. It is not Hippocrates. Hippocrates is not the father of medicine. Imhotep who lived 2,400 years before Hippocrates, as quoted by Sir William Osler, who was the founder of Johns Hopkins Hospital and has memorialized the works of, of Imhotep at the Johns Hopkins School that actually performed surgery, treated over 200 different conditions, and did so way before almost two, over two centuries before Hippocrates was born. So I invite you all to go and look this up and, and take, you know, don't take my word for it, look it up for yourself because we need to reestablish the right goalpost and gre give credit to whom credit is due. The, the so-called Chemites or Egyptians or what have you knew more about how to preserve dead people then the Greeks knew how to keep people alive. So we just want to make sure that that's, that's done. So let me just begin by telling you a little bit about my journey. And Pastor, I'm so grateful for your, for your monitor here because it makes, keeps me having to turn around. And I love that. I love that. So what we want to do is tell you a little bit about my, uh, about my journal journey. So there were some things as I was pondering this. First of all, many of you know, I went to, I've lived in Chicago all the life I've known about, gone to school in Chicago on the South Side, uh, and actually went to Loyola University in Chicago for undergrad and did my medical school training at the University of Illinois in Chicago and finished that about 1978. 
And if God says so, I'll be celebrating my 70th birthday next year. Amen. Amen. So what's important is when I was in practice, I practiced for 26 years as a urologist in the city of Chicago on the south side, right at 2850 South Wabash. That practice is still there. My former partners are still going. But it was a time in my life that I had to make a, a, question, uh, a decision. And I, I'd been talking about, and I think God had been leading me to think about what was I really doing as a urologist? And I was good at taking pieces of people out. I could take prostates out and bladders out, and I could prescribe all kinds of medicine. And I was good at it, and I think there was some help that was done. But I had to really think about, did I really continue to believe in that anymore? Because what came to me is that none of what I did cured anybody. The truth of the matter, none of what any of us do as physicians cure anybody. So I had to really think about that. And then I had to think about how would I get others to believe this uh, because they all thought I was crazy when I said, you know, I'm leaving practice and I'm going to go be the commissioner of health for the city of Chicago. I spent a few years as committed commissioner of health for the city of Chicago, which was a really interesting time. And I actually had absolutely no formal training in public health. In fact, when the mayor's office called me, I told them, no, you got the wrong guy. But God had another plan. And so that was, uh, and you know, I've been a, I've had an interesting spiritual journey. Um, I started out in the Baptist church, spent a lot of time in the nation of Islam under then El the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, from whom I've got the inspiration to go to medical school. Because at that time, we were talking about building a school and a hospital center. And I knew a lot about some scriptures. I'm not going to say I'm pastoring or anything, but I knew about that. But it wasn't enough. To read, is the one, to, to read and to be able to recite is one thing. But to internalize what you really believe is something totally different. And you don't need a lot of scriptures for that. You just have to believe. You have to want to believe. And that's what I wanted to do. And I was glad that God was working with me and speaking through my spirit. So when we think about what God has done for those who believe, what he said, I mean, what, what happens is Genesis, you know, we, he gave us the ability to co-create. He provided us male and female for the specific purpose of co-creation. So he shared that with us. And what were we supposed to do with that gift? Because in, now I'm, I'm going to put my urologist hat back on now. At the time of intercourse, somewhere between 400 and 500 million sperm are released. And it only takes one. So if it's, let's say it's 500 million sperm, that means 499,999,999 died for us to all be sitting here. You got to think about that. You know what that means? That means each and every one of you is special and uniquely created by whoever you believe to do something. Not just be here, but to do something. And you've all, we've all been endowed with, and I'm not going to preach, preaching, but, you know, that ain't what I do. That ain't what I do. I leave that up to y'all. So what I wanted to do, so when I started having these thoughts, my good friend Prince Asiel Ben Israel invited me to go to Israel and he gave me a tour. He said, you'd need a spiritual rejuvenation. So I went to Israel for 10 days. I spent, I've never told this story, so this is all hot off the presses, Ken. <laughs> and so I went there for what he called an Edenic perspective, to really reconnect really spiritually. Because I'm going to tell you something. Knowledge is one thing, but convicted belief is another. 
convicted belief. And so that's what I did. I went there. I went. I mean, I swam in the Dead Sea. I went all through old Jerusalem. I went to the Wailing Walls. I, went, I mean, did everything. And to see that this place was really the centerpiece of religious thought and to see the Muslims and the Jews and the Christians and all of these things and going onto the Mount of Olives and doing all of that kind of stuff to really reconnect me with myself was critical. Y'all following me? Okay, I'm just glad. I'm gonna get to, I know y'all didn't come to hear this tonight, but that's all right. So when I had to go to the point of taking the job as commissioner of the city of Chicago, I had to make a decision. Because first of all, the city don't pay well. And so from what I was making when I was in practice and what I was gonna make when I went into, and all this is gonna connect y'all, I promise. Um, I was gonna take about a 65% pay cut. Yeah. And what I had to do, what I had to answer this question, did I own my things or did my things own me? Because if you own your things, you can do with your things whatever you want to do with your things because you're in control. But if your things own you, they'll make you get up and get another job. They'll make you do all kinds of things in order to get what's needed to keep those things. And none of those things will improve you as a person. And all you will do is fall victim to what other people say and what the advertisers say is important for you in your life. And that's important because that's how they do you with food. Y'all all right? So I decided, no, my things didn't own me. I sold my house. I sold the cars. I sold all the stuff, and I went and took the job at the city of Chicago which turned out to be one of the best things I ever did. And I have an amazing team now at the Cook County Department of Public Health that I really, really, really enjoy. And Mary Gibb is one of those ladies that she's retired, but she was at the, and we had a great, have a great time at that. So this is what public health does. Most people have no idea, because you know what? I didn't either, but that's what we do. It's, it's really, your health is more determined by where you work, live and play than anything else. Because where you work, live and play determines what's available to you where you are, all right? So this is a, a little picture that I put together about how public health works. So if disease is the water going through the pipe, then public health is the valve to help try and shut it off. Y'all follow me? Now, medicine is like the bucket. We don't cure anything. We don't stop anything. Most of the advances in life that have happened have not happened because of what happens in hospitals. It happens because of what happened in public health. We're the ones that push for seat belts. We're the ones that push for vaccinations. We're the ones that did those things. What happens when you go to a hospital, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute, so what I want you to understand about the difference between, we always talk about prevention, but I want to talk about primary prevention. So primary prevention is you don't have the disease in question. We get marketed by a lot of stuff from hospitals and clinics and what have you about these preventive activities. And they're not preventive, they're early detection. That's what they are. You could have a mammogram every day and it won't protect you from getting the breast cancer. You can have a PSA done every day and it won't pro protect you from getting prostate cancer. You can have an EKG ev every day or a cardiac, whatever, and you still could fall dead of a heart attack. Okay, because they're not primarily preventive. Y'all got me? Okay, so let's keep going. Now, what if we, what if we could or think about Ignore, what's the role of medical care on our health? And I'm going to tell you, medical care is not the same thing as health care. Although they're marketed the same way, they're not the same. Because we don't, and we in the hospital system are not involved in health care. We're not. 
I did it for 26 years. I'm telling you what I know, not what somebody told me, and I'm going to show you why. Because the question is, all we do in medical care is treat the complication of a problem. We never go after the cause, but we treat the complication. Y'all following me? Okay, if you're not, just let me know. Then we'll, we'll catch you up. So if we a I looked at all of these things, if I asked you what the number one cause of death in America is, what would you say? You'd say heart disease, and I'd say you'd be absolutely wrong. Now you say, and all the physicians say, Terry, how can you say that? That's blasphemy. That's not true. It is heart disease. No, it is not. And I'm going to prove it to you, because that's why I asked the question, is it? And the reason I do this, the reason I do this, because I'm going to show you this guy, Martin McCary, at the Johns Hopkins, did a paper showing you that, the, that medical care is actually the third leading cause of death. No, I'm, this is not me now. This came out of, this is the British Journal of Medicine. It's not me. I'm just saying the third leading cause of death in America. Now, they would say that heart disease and cancer would be one and two. I, dis I disagree with that, and I'm going to show you why in the time that I got to do this because it, 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 it's an important thing. So when you talk about a heart attack, a heart attack is really a misleading term because it has absolutely nothing to do with the muscle of the heart in the early stage. There's nothing wrong with the heart to have a heart attack. The problem is in the blood vessels that feed the heart. The heart is just a muscle that beats, and it needs lots of blood to do that. So the problem is in the blood vessels, but the blood vessels themselves, they're not the cause of the problem. The cause of the problem is that the blood flows through the blood vessels, okay, and it, something happens that creates a blockage. But the stuff that's in the blood that carries, gets carried to the heart that causes the blockages, what is it? And how did it get there? It got there from the food. Does that make sense? Because the sole purpose of your digestive system, which starts in your mouth and ends with your rectum, is to extract from the foods that you eat the nutrients that you need to supply the body with what it needs to do the job for you that keeps you alive. Y'all follow me so far? Okay, I'm going to go. I ain't going to take a lot of time. To me, processed food may be the root of a cause of a lot of our diseases. Processed foods. I want you to think about that. Because those of us, you know, my parents grew, on a, grew up on a farm. How many of your parents grew up on farms? I know none of y'all did. Right. Uh, and maybe you did. But the key is, is that most of the foods, see, when you don't grow and pick and prepare your food, you have no idea what you're eating. You're going by what they told you, but not what's there. So if this is the situation, and these are the risk factors, and you always hear this, high blood pressure, overweight and obesity, unhealthy diet, cholesterol, not moving around. Moving is one thing, high blood sugar. Most of all those things are caused by the foods that we eat. They are not diseases that stand on their own like the, the medical profession. And he's like, how are you saying that? Because it's true. It's true. We have to stop listening to what's going on. Now, I'm not saying that there's no room or no reason to see physicians or stuff like that, but I can tell you as a physician that went to school here in the city of Chicago, the University of Illinois, in the four years of medical school, I had 40 minutes of nutrition. And that nutrition wasn't really nutrition. That was really telling us about scurvy and beriberi, some diseases you'd never see that are caused by not having anything. I'm telling you what I know, what, not what somebody told me, okay? So what we want to do now is remember we said that there's something that travels in the blood that causes damages to the blood vessel that causes the blockage in our heart vessels. But it's not just there. I'm going to show you in a minute. So let's take a look at this. So 
this whole thing that is creating this, uh, this is a clip from Forks Over Knives. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but if you haven't, you ought to. And what you see, this is the key to understanding so-called heart disease, so-called strokes, so-called diseases in the, in the uh, legs and what have you. So let's play the clip. While Dr. Campbell was publishing his China study, Dr. Esselstyn was getting some powerful data from the research he'd started in 1985. He began with 24 patients, but six had dropped out in the first year, leaving him with a total of 18. At the end of five years, we had uh, follow-up angiograms in 11 of the group and halted their disease. There was no progression. And there were four where we had rather exciting evidence of regression of disease. These results were astonishing. The diet produced something that medication and surgery never had before, actual reversals of heart disease. The biological mechanism that caused these reversals centers on the lining of our veins and arteries, the endothelial cells. They are the absolute life jackets of our blood vessels. You're young and you're a teenager, you're healthy, you could spread those out one layer thick and you'd have something that would cover six or eight tennis courts. In 1988, scientists discovered that endothelial cells manufactured the gas nitric oxide. Well, what does nitric oxide do? Nitric oxide keeps our blood flowing smoothly without being sticky. It also helps to dilate constricted blood vessels during physical activity and inhibits the formation of plaque. And most importantly, nitric oxide is a powerful force for eliminating the inflammation that seems to go with this plaque. However, scientific tests have demonstrated that when we start eating the typical Western diet, our endothelial cells are damaged. When you're getting to be in your 40s and 50s and 60s and you've been slaughtering your endothelial cells. You don't have those six or eight tennis courts. You may be down to one and a half or two, and they can't protect you. Yet according to Dr. Esselstyn, when we began eating a whole foods, plant-based diet, the damage to our endothelial cells not only stops, it starts to reverse. Now we could go home now because the major message is there. What else do you need to know? But I'll go on with a little bit more because y'all came for a lot more than this. So let's do this. So the real problem is this whole inflammation piece. And this inflammation is what is damaging the endothelial cells. And all the endothelial cells are trying to do is to try and reheal themselves. But every time we, it tries to reheal itself, you take some more of the food in, it keeps more, creates more inflammation. So they can't ever heal because every time you try, and, it's like you bump your knee and your knee is trying to get better. And the next thing you know before you get a chance to, for it to get better, you hit your knee again. And then you hit it again and again. So that's the problem. That's the whole issue. And when we see this, and you know, there is a role, a role for, for what happens in hospitals, but we need to be clear about what's really happening. It's not that we go there for a complication of our problem to be managed, not to cure the problem. Okay? So I don't want anybody to say, well, Dr. Macy, don't go to no doctor no more. No, that's not what I said. Because this is, this is this whole thing right here. And I'm going to tell you, I have firsthand knowledge of having one of those blockages. Because I was a guy, before I changed my diet, I was a guy that ate a porterhouse steak every day. Why? Because I liked it. No ribeyes, porterhouse, and T-bone. OK, I had them cut from the butcher, wrapped up, and brought home. So I know that, that those cows are mad at me. <laughs> but this is what's happening, that little blockage there. But let me tell you something. If you have a blockage anywhere, you have them everywhere. 
okay? That's why people, if you have a heart, if, you, if you've got problems with the heart or blockages of the vessels, vessels in the heart, you got them in your neck that goes up and creates a problem for you in terms of stroke. You got other kinds of, uh, and, and if it's in any of the blood vessels in the brain, you get a stroke. And if it's down in your blood vessels in your leg, you get what they call peripheral vascular disease. They give you all these different names, but it's all the same disease. It's all the same. And the cause is all the same. And the cure is all the same. Or to reverse these. And that's what Dr. Esselstyn just finished telling you about. So then they put these little things. I got one. I have one. In my, on the left side of my heart. Because I was eating crazy. And this, this is a little stent right here. Oh, let me see what's happening. Uh -oh. Anyway. Well, anyway, you can see these things are little metal things, and the way they put them in now, they've gotten much more sophisticated. They sometimes go through the wrist in your arm, but with mine, they had to go through the leg, feed the wire all the way up to my heart, go into the vessel where they thought it was blocked, squirt some dye in to see where it was blocked. Then you slide this little metal thing in its closed position over the wire to the area that's blocked up. Then they slide a balloon into that and open it up and just... That's what they do. They just crack the thing open and then leave this little thing behind the stent. So, yes, it's absolute, absolutely important in an emergency to do that because if you don't get that unblocked, you could have a problem and die. But the other part is, is that you've still done nothing to correct the reason why you got the blockage in the first place. And unless you do something to stop the blockages from happening in the inflammation, you will re-stenose that. That does not cure the problem and get you over the emergency, which is critical, and you need to get that, but doesn't stop the blockage. Now, are there kids in this audience? They told me they may be, but I'm going to show this for the men and the women in the audience. This is a study from the Journal of the American Medical Association, and what this is looking at is men, and I, I did a lot of work in erectile dysfunction in my practice a lot, and, and in fact, it was most of the men that I saw for that that I referred to internal medicine doctors because many of them had not seen an internal medicine doctor. But when you look at guys who had a heart attack, all right, in this, in this case, there's 571 of them, 464 of them had erectile problems before they had a heart attack. Sim similar things are true for chest pain, congestive heart failure, angina, including death. That actually when men were suffering from not being able to get and or maintain an erection, that was the earliest clinical sign that there was significant endothelial cell damage throughout their entire body and they were going to suffer one of these problems. And it's still true today. And the reason for that is that the, the penis is rich with endothelial cells. That's what is necessary in order to create the re erection. And when those endothelial cells are, are damaged, then it doesn't pr promote appropriate blood flow and blockage of that blood flow for it to come out. And so we see these graphs all the time, and I've sh shown these things a gazillion times, but this is obesity on the top and diabetes on the bottom. And they look the same. In fact, we got so fat and so diabetic, we had to change the colors. <laughs> and that's a tragedy that we had to do that. Because what's happening is that the reason one follows the other because one causes the other. It's the obesity that's causing the diabetes. And the real problem with that is the food that we're eating that's causing that. Same thing is true for this. This is high blood pressure. This is looking at so-called heart disease. There is no so-called heart disease. It's either, this is all dietary problems, okay? Same thing for two. This is what, stroke? Stroke is just that blockage in the brain. Heart attack is that blockage in your heart. Peripheral vascular disease, a blockage, you know, it's all the same disease. It's not different. 
You don't have, they, they just make you different, and they use it to help you convince that you need to see different people, but what you really need to see is a nutritionist who understands the power and the practice of plant-based foods. That's what you need to see. And if you look at this, this is death rates for cancer around the United States, still, still clustered in the part of the country where people are eating so-called rich foods. Yeah, they rich all right, rich in things that help kill you. So is there something else? Well, let's see. So let's look at what happened between 1950 and 2000. I think my battery just died. So can you just advance that for me, please? Appreciate it. My clicker died. But we are not going to let the devil get us. So just go ahead and keep going. So keep going. Again. And one more. Oh, go back one. Went too far. So look at this. We used to eat in 1950, we used to drink 2.9 gallons of milk, you know? And that's low-fat milk. And low-fat is a joke. So let me tell you about milk. Whole milk is 3%. It's just 3%, whole milk. So when they tell you 2%, and they tell you it's 33% less fat, that is mathematically correct, but it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> because you're only talking about 1%. Thank you. You're only talking about 1%. So it's important that you understand. And let's keep going here. All right. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, and I can show you some other things about how much more meat we're eating now. Some of you were here in 1950, some before, but we eat a whole lot more now than we eat na ate then. I know, because I was here. So this, this group here, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, this is not me, this is the cancer group. So they, they created a classification. I'm just going to focus on group one and two. So group one says that if you're eating this, this is definitely cancer-causing. That's what carcinogenic means. And group two means it may be. And then group two, uh, A means probably. And then two B means possibly. But I want you to focus on the group one. And then we want to talk about the definitions. What's meat? People say, what's meat? Well, any meat that from the muscle, when you eat meat, you are eating the muscle of an animal. That's what you're eating. So when you eat your chicken wing, you, when you bite down, and, and you notice in your arm, you got two bones in this top part of your arm right here, and one bone down here. You got one bone in this part of your leg and two bones down here. When you eat into that chicken, chicken uh, wing and you bite down where the one bone is, you are just chawing yourself through the biceps and triceps of the chicken. That's what you're eating. And sometimes there's a nerve or a blood vessel, you just slurp that on down with it. <laughs> when you eat a chicken leg, when you eat a chicken leg, you are biting right into the muscle right here. This is where you bite, right in here, or the front, right in here, and or the other legs down in the part where the two bones are, right in here. Meat is muscle. When you, when, I, I, I was going to bring this, but I didn't have time to show it. But I was going to show you how they cut, they kill the cow, how they break it down, and how they butcher the different parts of it. So you can't see the cow and what you're eating because it's all broken down. But if you put it all back together, you could see where it comes from. So if these classifications, red meat was classified as group 2A, okay? And there was some association needed. But processed meat was classified as group what? One, which means what? Is defi definitely, definitely carcinogenic. Four strips of bacon or one hot dog increases your colorectal cancer risk by 18%. Not one a year, just one or four strips of bacon. 
So y'all go ahead on if you want to. But I'm going to tell you something. My job that God gave me was to tell you. And that's it. That's all I can. That's all the pastor can do up there. He can tell you. Now, what you do with it is on you. And don't come running talking about lay hands. Now, I'm going to knock you down. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lay some hands on you. So, let me get back here. Let me get spirits. I'm in the church. All right. So, the other thing that creates this inflammation, okay, for so-called cardiovascular disease and cancer is this thing, what's really important now is the role of the bacteria in your gut. And what happens is when you eat plant-based foods, you have a different kind of colony of bacteria in your gut than it is when you eat meat. And I'm going to show you how in just a minute. When they see this over here, this is cheese and shrimp and eggs and steak and all that stuff. When you eat that, it changes what's called the, um, this, this choline, this, the key word is the choline. When it goes through your digestive system in your gut, it makes a thing called TMA, trimethylamine. The liver supplies your gut with what are called FMOs, flavin monooxidases. And those things then convert your TMA to TMAO, one of the most potent things that create inflammation in your blood vessels. Boy, it's quiet in here. Amen lights. Okay, y'all following me? Do I need to say that again or y'all got it? You sure? Okay. So to prove that this is what's happening, they found a group of vegans that had not been eating meat and then paid them to eat some meat. No, I'm telling you, this is what it was, to, in order to do the study. So an omnivore, that's a person that eats meat. So they gave them some meat, and they measured the level of TMAO. Y'all see that? And then here's the vegan. When, they, when, uh, when he was, when he, she was eating, you see that there was no rise in the TMAO, in the vegan group, Okay. And when they paid the vegans to do this, guess what happened? That happened in the vegans. So when you, you say, well, can I eat a little meat? You want to be a little sick? It's up to you. And this is also the concentrations of the TM, TMAO that's in the, in the um, a urine. So this is where you get it. Eggs, milk, liver, red meat, shellfish, and fish. That's where you get that from. And that's what they do. They metabolize it to TMAO. And you can blunt this. You can stop this by stop eating that. See, I want y'all to understand something. I'm not the food police. I'm not. No more than the preacher is the spiritual police. Our job is to tell you what to, tell you what to do or tell you what we believe God is telling us to do. I believe God is telling me to, tell, to do this, and we've got science to back it up. The other thing you need to know is that choline gets concentrated in prostate cancer cells. So, and there's, and there's eggs. Choline is in eggs. It's in all the shell, uh, shellfish and what have you. And there's, there's, store, there's uh, studies that show that prostate cancer cell metastases, or when the prostate cancer cells, you can see this choline in, as well as the glycerol phosphocholine in the cells of the prostate cancer. And it's that that they use to do the special kind of MRI looking for these choline-containing cells that they then can make a diagnosis that your prostate cancer has spread. Because that's what the test is looking for. All right? So Dr. Dean Ornish, a great guy, met a long time ago, went out to, in fact, when I was getting ready to have my stent, I begged my cardiologist to let me get, go. I didn't want to have it, and I said, let me go see Dean, because Dean is out in South Salido, California. He had a heart program out there where he was reversing all this stuff with diet and uh, meditation and so on and so forth, and that's what this study was, looking at men who had prostate cancer. He took one group and put them on a whole food plant-based diet, 
supplemented with meditation, some other things, and let the other ones do what they wanted to do. And then he took the blood from each of these groups, and they took some c prostate cancer cells from a lymph node that had a lot of prostate cancer cells. In the group that were eating the meat and doing what they wanted to do, only 9% of the prostate cancer cells were killed. But in the group that was vegan, 70% of the prostate cancers were killed, prostate cancer cells. So what kind of blood do you want? Okay. He also showed that there was the genes that produced the cancer. Here it is looking at it before, and you see now is this because the genes that were producing the cancer were turned off by the diet. You understand what I'm saying? So it's important. So yes, we need more research, and directionally this is important, but it's telling you the role of food. So how is the cause of disease treated or truly prevented? How do you treat the cause? Well, what's the cause? Food. So how do you treat it? Why y'all get quiet when I ask you what was the... What's wrong with y'all? Wake up. I'm not up here talking for my help. I'm talking for your help. Y'all don't hear me. Anyway, we treat the cause by not putting the stuff in the creeks in the first place. This is a great guy. This guy, Peter Menzo, he went around the whole world taking pictures of a week's worth of food from people from all over the world. That's what he did. And he has a wonderful book and a slide a thing called Hungry Planets. Great, great series. Now, I'm just going to show you a few. So this is Bhutan. Uh, that shows you where Bhutan is way over. You can see this is the United States, South America. This is the African continent. This is Europe up here, and this is over toward Asia, and that's Australia down there. So these are some people that farm on their own. Could we darken a little bit more? I want because I want these uh, people to be able to see these slides. Very nice. Could bring the lights down just a tad more. So this is a week's worth of food for the people in Bhutan, right here. This is a week's worth of food. See this big bag right there? What do you think is in that bag? Rice. Red rice. Red rice. They eat it with every meal, and they eat a lot of it. In fact, they're going to eat all of that. Okay? So that's the bag right there. And there's red rice. This is China. These are Chinese people. What do you see here? And here's some, there's some eggs, a few eggs. Here's some meat. And guess what's in that bag? Rice. Okay? This is Germany. Now you're seeing a whole lot more stuff in bottles and boxes, right? And where are the vegetables? Oh, here they are up there. And here's lots more eggs, and they like drinking stuff in cartons and so on and so forth. Okay? Y'all see that? And now this is India. These are people that are vegan for the most part. But look at this. This is, a week's, this is a week's worth of food, not one meal. Some of my tables got more food for one meal than they got on the table for a whole week. All right? This is America. I don't know. It just happened to be black people. I don't know. I ain't got nothing to do with that. The man just took a week's worth of food. I'm just telling you. And then when we ask about why do black people have more disease, here's why. All right? And we love this stuff right here. It's the worst thing you can put in your mouth. The cheese is full of salt and saturated fat. And we're eating this stuff by the boatloads now in pizza. And you've got pepperoni, which is a processed meat on the top, or a sausage, which is a processed meat. All that stuff is right there. Now, I'm not talking about just black folks. I'm talking about anybody that's eating this stuff. And you see, even these potato chips aren't real. They're a potato product. They're not made from real potatoes. And then you see all of this stuff, all in packages, all processed. Okay? And this... This is here's the vegetables. <laughs> right there. 
Don't laugh. Some of y'all's kitchens look just like this. You understand what I'm saying? This is a reason, this is why America is spending more money than any other country in the world on so-called health care, but ranks 45th in the world in terms of health. Because we are poisoning ourselves with every bite of this stuff. This stuff in this box, this thing right here, it's a chemical concoction. It's water, carbonic acid, some kind of sweetener, usually high fructose corn syrup, and then you wonder why we have so much problem. And milk, milk, cow milk. Cow milk is the absolute perfect food for baby cows. <laughs> there is no reason why humans should drink cow milk. The only milk a human needs is the milk from the breast of its mother. Once you outgrow that, you don't need milk again ever in your life. Now, you drink it because you want to, but the other thing I want to say about milk is that the milk that's in from a cow is specifically and divinely created to take a 65-pound calf and put it on the road to becoming a 400-pound cow. We got a TV program called My 600 Pound Life. Am I, am I lying? No. People weigh 600 pounds. So I'm just saying to you, and I'm getting ready to get done now, but I'm just saying to you, what's happening to us is no surprise. What's happening to us and, what's ha and the food, that milk that's containing the chemicals necessary to make that cow grow, one of those things is called insulin growth factor one. Insulin growth factor makes cells grow. And when you have a cow, you got to take, you don't have all day to take that little calf and make it a cow. So when we eat that stuff and we drink that stuff, we're drinking the insulin growth factor one along with it. And what's happening is that if we have tumor cells that are already growing apparently, those tumor cells will also take what's from the insulin growth factor one and make your cancers grow more vigorously. Okay? So this is the real pharmacy. This is the pharmacy. And it's packaged perfectly. Let me tell you how good this is. You don't have to refrigerate it. You don't have to cook it. You know, everything here, you can eat it just the way it is. And some of you and most of us ought to eat more of it just the way it is. You know, we cook. I grew up in a house. They put a pot. In the old days, they put a pot on, go to church. <laughs> Come back, stuff done cooked. And the, and the string beans, instead of like this, they like. <laughs> you pick the string beans up with a fork, and they just bend all over the side of the fork. So we've overcooked that stuff, and there's no, no life in it. So we need, if there's no crunch, ain't no, you know, there's no value. There's not as much value out, as it ought to be, because you need that fiber to help create the bacterial uh, places for the bacteria to grow. So food-related causes of diseases anywhere you can fix because that's what we're dealing with. And so what do we need? What we need is our government not to continue. Our government is help is complicit. There's a movie called Diet Fiction. And in the movie Diet Fiction, I say that the United States government is complicit in the leading causes of death in America. And it's that way because we, our, our food, or even our recommendations for nutritional recommendations, all those things are controlled by the interest group to make sure that the beef gets on our nutritional recommendation, the chicken, the eggs, the milk, that's what happens. Okay? I'm just telling you. So I want you to check out this movie. You want to play the clip? We done. I'm just about done. And only Arnold Schwarzenegger. I ate a lot of meat. They showed us commercials. Steak. 
That's what a man eats. Selling that idea that real man eat meat. Serious man food. But you got to understand that's marketing. That's not based on reality. I've been teaching fighting techniques to government agencies for more than 15 years. Then I got injured. Unable to teach for at least six months, I spent more than a thousand hours studying science on recovery and nutrition and stumbled across a study about the Roman gladiators. The gladiators were predominantly vegetarian. How could the original professional fighters be so powerful, eating only plants? When I made the switch to a plant-based diet, I qualified for my third Olympic team. I broke two American records. I was like, man, I should have done this a long while ago. When I went plant-based, I wasn't sure if I was going to survive. And I actually became like a machine. One of the biggest misconceptions in sports nutrition is that we have to have animal protein to perform at a high level. That's just not true. Sometimes you have to do things that you know your competitors aren't doing. Today's blood and yesterday's blood. I think this is going to wake a lot of people up. I was recovering better, not getting as sore. This was our best season in the last 15 years, and we had 14 guys on plant-based diets. We all want to feel great, have more energy. Cholesterol was 276. Today, 169. Whoa, now you're talking. Most guys my age can keep up with the grandchildren. My grandchildren can't keep up with me. It's not one set of dietary guidelines for improving your performance as an athlete. Another one for reversing heart disease, reversing diabetes. It's the same for all of them. Someone asked me, how could you get as strong as an ox without eating any meat? And my answer was, have you ever seen an ox eating meat? It's out already. It's on Netflix. I would suggest that you, oh, I would suggest that you uh, take a take a look at it. Uh, it's, it'll change your mind if you and your pre misconceptions about what people need. We've been sold a bag of lies. Pastor, if I can take a line that says Satan deceived where did he see what? See everybody. All mankind. That includes us. Now, I'm going to end on this since we're in the seventh day of Venice. This is Terry Butler in Loma Linda University. And I would ask that every one of you go to your computer, look up this particular gentleman, the Adventist Health Study 2, and Terry Butler. I'm going to just show you just a few because this is my last, I think, the last slide. But I want you to, uh, you really need to look at this because the Adventists have it right. Okay, the Adventists have it right, but even though they don't have it, even though they have it right, there are a lot of us that are Advent a lot of Adventists don't believe it, and we're not eating it. And when you start looking at the differences between Black Adventists and White Adventists, you'll see what I'm talking about. Played a little bit of the clip. Let me just bring uh, uh, alcoholic beverages and, and so on, much less uh, for the vegetarian groups. So th there are a number of uh, specific foods or food groups uh, that are playing a role in our dietary lifestyle. So when we uh, are looking at this, we've got to be careful that uh, we uh, don't just sort of focus on, say, meat or red meat, for instance. We've got to uh, control for the other factors in the diet that may have an influence on the outcome. So in our analyses, we are able to control for these other various factors. And as you see some of the results, you'll notice that. One of the things that we're able to look at, because we've asked the question, uh, what was your predominant dietary lifestyle like at different stages of your life? When you were in childhood, as an adolescent, uh, as a young adult, and virtually by every decade of life. So we've, we have that information. And what we've discovered that 
35% uh, of our population are what we call uh, lifetimers in terms of their diet. In other words, their diet has been consistent right throughout their life, 35%. And the second chart there that you see, you can see the breakdown of that. The LT stands for lifetime. So you can see down the bottom, the largest segment is lifetime non-vegetarian, 24%. Uh, so they have remained non-vegetarian for all their life. The next largest is the lacto-ovo-vegetarian, 10%. And then the smaller ones, we have the vegan, pesco, and the semi-vegetarian. So we will be able to look at the effect not only of the current diet since the beginning of the study, but also the lifetime dietary effect, uh, which may turn out to be somewhat different. Let me uh, have a look at uh, with you about... BMI, Body Mass Index and Mortality in Seventh-day Adventists. And this is, goes back from 1960 to 2010. And we, we've been able to do this because we've collected information asking participants, how much did you weigh when you were uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 and so on? And we can go back and for those who have been part of the previous study, Adventist Health Study 1, and we have something like 7,000, 7, I think, we're able to confirm that by going back to 1975. So we've got that history uh, of weight. And so using this, this is what we've come up with. So body mass index is weight in kilograms divided by height in metres squared. And I imagine most of you know what your BMI is or have got a, an idea. Uh, the normal, you come up with a value uh, that will be somewhere from uh, 16 to 40 plus. So here what we consider normal weight is 18.5 to 25. From 25 to 30, it's considered overweight, and then obese is 30 plus. Now, we know that here in North America, uh, and, and this is true in, in my country, we have an obesity epidemic. We seem, it's been going up and up and up, and it's not only older people, but it's the younger ones as well. There's a lot of concern about that. So it's really uh, very, very topical, and I think we can uh, contribute to this uh, understanding and, and findings that will help in this. I just want you to... Uh, I, I just showed a similar you graph a, this a morning. A this is looking at BMI for the different vegetarian groups. So you can see vegan, lack... Well, you can see which groups did better. And I want you to look at it for yourself. I want you to be sitting down at your computer looking at this yourself so you can understand that what is being preached is not just being preached for preaching's sake. There's basis to it, not just biblically based, but there's science behind it. So it's not a thing about whether well, I want to do that, I don't want to, you know. You do this. If you want a little out of life, do a little. If you want a lot out of life, do a lot. If you want a lot of change, you got to have a lot of effort. A little effort won't give you a lot of change. So the key, the first thing you got to make up is your mind. The first thing you want to, like, and just to quote a scripture, John 5, verses 2 through 9. Jesus asked a man laying on the mat for 48 years, what he asked him? He said, do you want to be made whole? He asked him. And one of our previous pastors, and I'm going to say this and I'm really done, one of our previous pastors I went to, Reverend Reggie Wilson, or, or Williams, who's a lawyer, he said, you know, Jesus gave the man a prescription. And he said, what do you mean? A prescription is an invitation to participation in your own restoration. <laughs> say it again. The prescription was an invitation to participation 
in your own restoration. He didn't go over and pick the man up. He didn't call somebody over to pick up the man. He asked the man, did you want to be well? Now, you know what? I'm going to ask you, do you want to be well? And if you want to be made well, you got some work to do. First, you got to pick up your mat. You got to pick up your mat and walk. That means you got to go somewhere. You got to do something. You got to put some energy out on your own and stop believing in fairy tales about some angel coming trouble in the water and everything going to be okay. No, <laughs> that ain't going to happen. So I, I really, really want to thank you. want to remind you we've got our food summit coming up, Michael Greger. Uh, we got a bunch of folks coming in town. That'll be the first week, around the first weekend in October at Loyola in uh, Maywood. Uh, you, can, you can always contact me there to get it. And I also recommend that you read Dr. Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die. How Not to Die. And with that, Pastor, thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mason. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. So um, if I could have somebody help me with the mic. Are these mics on, Charlie? Question about alkaline water, a gimmick. A gimmick. Drink water. You know, drink the best water you can drink, you know, I mean, but alkaline, you, what is it, what difference does it make to drink alkaline water and eat meat? That don't make no sense. You make, if you eat vegetables, if you eat plant, you will automatically be alkaline. Okay? So those are gimmicks. Don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you do do what you want to do. But if you're going to drink alkaline water and still eat all this other stuff, you wasting your money and your time. Next question. <laughs> If uh, you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, uh, do you still need to take uh, statins or cholesterol-lowering medicine, or is the uh, plants th good enough? That's a great question. The deal I made with my cardiologist when, he, when I agreed to let him go ahead and put the stent in, of course, I couldn't argue with him. I already had the thing in my leg, and I was on the table already. Um, I told him, I say, you go ahead and put this stent in. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not taking the Lipitor. Now, you all, this is me. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm telling you what I did. I said, I'm not taking the drug because it creates all kinds of muscle problems, potential liver problems, and everything else. And I was a physician. I'm like, I'm not doing that. I said, but this is what I will do. I will not put anything in my mouth that has cholesterol, bad saturated fats, or anything like that from this day forward. And that was my trip toward veganism. That's how it happened for me. Okay. I want to know, um, coming from a person that was eating porterhouse steaks after the stint, what was your actual? No, place? before, honey. Not after. Before. Okay. I wasn't no fool. Okay. <laughs> what What did that journey look like? Did you just leave out the doctor's office and like I'm just going to be vegan or? Was it a slow process? What did it look like? Well, first of all, I didn't even know what vegan was. All I knew was where the cholesterol was. That's what I knew as a physician. And so I decided I wasn't going to eat anything with that in it. I didn't care what it was called, okay? It could have been called whatever. But I knew I wasn't going to do that because I wasn't going to take that. And in God we trust all others must have data. So I went back every month for a cholesterol test, for a profile, to prove that I was doing, I mean, to prove that what I was doing was achieving the result that he was looking for. Now, I, don't be crazy, y'all. Don't say, Dr. Mason said he just did. No, 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 no. That was what Dr. Mason did. Y'all got to be got And Notice I did all of that under the supervision of my physician. 
and God we trust, all others must have data. So when you think you're doing something, thinking is not enough. Go get the data. When you go see your doctor, have those blood, blood tests drawn so you can be sure that what you think is happening is actually happening because you might have some other issue that is, that is apparently producing these things, cholesterol and stuff, for you. So always go back and, and you know, just like, don't just, because we know that eating plant-based, and that's what I'd rather call it, plant-based, uh, will also have a very, very good effect on that type 2 diabetes. Next question. Right here. So, yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Mason, too, for coming here and sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. So I have the soy question. Is it healthy or is it unhealthy? Does it spike estrogen? Is it mucus building? Like, I'm just trying to figure this out. Yeah, well, we know that milk, the regular milk does most everything you just said, okay? Now, soy, see, we gotta stop looking for the wonder thing. But somebody else the one thing we can do that's gonna make everything all right. Okay. Stop doing that. It's not the one thing you do, and it's not the one thing you do once in a while. It's what you do most of the time. So the question about soy, I'm not as, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, all of that stuff is processed, whether it's soy milk, almond milk, whatever. What I, it's, uh, but I'm not saying that's bad because there are lots of people that drink, uh, eat soy in other parts of the world and they use a lot of soy. Now, is their soy processed the same way our soy is processed? Is it, so I, that's what I'd be looking at is what's the level of processing. When I was in Israel, I ate a lot of soy, but they had a uh, farm where they grew the organic soybeans. And then I saw them, no pesticides, and I saw them take those soybeans to their processing factory and make the soy milk. And then I saw them take that and create the tofu and the ice cream and all the other stuff. And it was delicious. And I'm, I'm sure that that soy, and most of you are not going to eat enough good organic soy to create a hormone problem for yourself if you don't already have one. That's what I would say. That's a short answer. Right there. Right there. Where? I want to add to your question about soy. Um, I agree with what Dr. Mason said. Soy, if it's minimally processed, is not bad. Tofu is not processed, like if you're thinking about like a soy burger, you know, if it's minimally processed, it's not bad. Tofu is not bad. Um, tempeh is made from soy that's fermented, um, but it's made, when they ferment it, it actually makes it healthy and it's good for the gut bacteria. So soy is not a bad thing, plus soy, in plant-based foods has phytochemicals, phytonutrients that really are very beneficial. And so I think soy gets a bad rap, but unless you're eating Morningstar soy burgers all the time, soy won't be a bad thing for you. Unless you have breast cancer, then that may be something else. The one thing I wanted to just say too is you gotta watch out for all the Me Too, to your point, all the Me Too food. That is, there is what's called, I heard the word earlier here, transitional foods. Transition, transit means you're moving. Okay, not standing still. So if you're eating transitional food, that means you should be moving from what you're eating, including the transitional food, to the plant-based foods. So you don't get stuck on the fake stuff that gives you the same taste and textures that you've had. You want to keep moving toward that. You want to be on the way toward a full plant-based di plant diet. That's what you know. I don't want to call it vegan, but just, I just eat plant. People ask me what I eat. You know what I tell them? I eat plants. That's what I tell them I eat. Then they look at you crazy, like you're walking around with stuff in your back pocket. I'm like, no, I just eat plants. Is it, is it, then you gotta think about it. Is it a plant? Yes, okay, you can eat it. <laughs> yes.
Thank you. Um, I was a vegetarian for maybe about 20 years. The past three years I have been vegan, but the uh, pulmonologists have diagnosed me with gas exchange disease. They said there is no cure. I've nearly died because the part of my lungs that filters in the oxygen and filters out the carbon dioxide often stops, and I've gone without air for definitely more than three minutes. I guess you can live four minutes without it. So what kind of plant or spice or herb should I eat? Because the traditional doctors, have, they just said, you will die from this. And I have nearly died from it. It can happen at any moment. One moment I'm breathing, the next moment everything shuts down because my lungs, the alveoli or whatever it is, cannot filter out the ox cannot filter in the oxygen and filter out the carbon dioxide. The answer to that question is I don't know. Oh, okay. No, I'm just being honest with you. I don't know. No, I asked I would, another I would, famous I would vegan refer doctor. you to somebody. I, first of all, oh, you could refer. I refer you to somebody like Dr. Neil Barnard in Washington D.C. He has a whole clinic there, so you could see Dr. Neil N E A L Barnard B A R N A. Right, I've heard of him. Yes, he's written a bunch of different things. So I would see somebody like that. I don't practice anything anymore. I don't have an office. I don't see patients. I don't, and I don't miss it. Um, I don't do any of that anymore. So what I do is I refer people, and that's what I would do for you. Because is I don't want to tell you something. Is there anyone here in Chicago? Not that I'm aware of. No, okay. Not that, let me put it this way, not that I have had experience with that have done the kind, these are men, that I've men and women that I've invited to our conference. They're well published. Uh, you might, as a, as a, if you want to raise a question, you could also ask Michael, uh, Michael Greger from nutritionfacts.org, he, he will take questions too. And he might have someone else that he might refer you to. Okay. But I don't thank know, and I, and I don't want to tell you something wrong. Okay, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Right. Dr. Mason. Oh, wait a minute, where is the other one? Right here, right here. Where, okay. Right here, right here. Uh, Dr. Mason, you made yes. the statement that we should uh, refrain from milk. How are we going, to, what plants should we eat so that we can get enough calcium? Or is that... Uh, you ever heard of collard greens, Swiss yeah. chard, so, broccoli, bok choy? Okay, so normal, normal servings of that will, will provide Absolutely. enough calcium for us. You don't see cows drinking milk. Right, okay, I just want to know. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm just saying you don't see cows drinking milk. Right well, the thing is... You got to be careful what the, the meat and dairy industry put out. That's right. That's right. Because they're going to put out what sells their products. So yeah, the, I, the answer I got, and you can Google foods that contain, vegetables that contain calcium. But a lot of them are the ones I just told you. Collard greens, bok choy, a lot of those things contain the calcium. You don't need that much. Mm -hmm. Kale, most of, see, you know what? God had it right. We got it wrong. Anybody that could create a plant that would be 90, I mean, be uh, 180, no, I'm sorry, 93 million miles away from the sun and arrange the plant so the leaves of the plant absorb the maximum amount of sunlight. And then that sunlight along with the water that the plant comes up and the carbon dioxide that it takes out of the air create food powered by the sun by the use of a, a thing called a chloroplast inside the, the plant. So the, the sunlight, the sun is, it, it takes eight minutes from the light from the sun to reach the plant. The plant then makes this conversion. And during that conversion, it makes glucose and it gives off carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, it gives off oxygen. The oxygen we breathe and the stuff we breathe out, the carbon dioxide goes to the plant. All of the fiber and the phytonutrients. You heard her talk about phytonutrients. These are things, if you ever notice the color of a rainbow, that has lots of colors in it, right? So does those plants. There is nothing, nothing, and I don't care what anybody tells you, you can get all your essential amino acids. In fact, you can get as much protein as you need, so-called protein. Protein is not a meat. Protein is a series of amino acids. I'm going to make a slide. It's just a series of amino acids put together. 
And all of those amino acids can be found in plants. You have to eat a wide variety of them, but they're all in plants. So I can guarantee you that if you're eating a high, a high uh, if you're eating a plant-based diet, you will not become deficient. Now you've got to eat the right plants from the right sources in order to make certain that you get all those. And I would add, not just when I add plants, I'm talking about beans, legumes, all the other things too. Not just green leafy plants. Because all these things have different constituents. All right, next question. I just want to know about GMOs. Do you, can you ex explain about genetically modified organisms? What's to explain? You just said it. They're genetically modified organisms. Okay, who, who genetically changed them? Who then modified them? So I, get the original thing. It's, corp it's all about money. And the cows that we, that, do you know that, that, and I don't want to get in, there's another movie you should watch called Cowspiracy. Cowspiracy. C O W. S-P-I-R-A-C-Y, cowspiracy. It'll talk about the impact. Why do you think Oprah Winfrey was sued the way she was when she said, I'm never going to eat another burger? Because she violated the veggie libel laws. And right now they changed the uh, veggie libel laws because it used to be that you had to say something that was false. But now you say anything that causes them to have a drop in sales, you can be sued. Absolutely, they win it because they got more money than you and I got to get the lawyers to help them win it. Next question. Right here, Doc. Right here. Yes, sir. Well, she got a mic too. Yeah, but he was. He, he been She's afterwards. Okay, go ahead. Wait. I have uh, end-stage renal disease, and my and my nephrologist is complaining that I'm not getting enough protein. I suggested uh, I eat just enough meat to get what I need. But uh, my question is where I can get, uh, where I get that same kind of protein from uh, plant-based food. You know, it, it also depends on, now I'm not, again, I don't get into prescription things. What I would do is I'd ask you to see the same person I told the other person to see. You. We could have Dr. Barnard. He's going to be here in October, but you don't have to wait till then. You can, you can write him. Um, I don't, again, I don't take care of any kind of patients at all, so I don't want to make any recommendations about that, but you could write him because there are foods, uh, and you've got to watch your potassium and a bunch of other things if you have renal disease. Okay, so what's the full name again? Barnard, Neil Barnard. I, he was just here. I just had him here, too, but we're going to bring him back, and probably I'll bring him back and we can do a much bigger venue, and I can have him and Mike and uh, Baxter Montgomery, who's a cardiologist in Houston, Texas. Has another one you could see too, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. He's at the Texas Heart Institute in Houston, Texas. Baxter, B-A-X-T-E-R Montgomery, and he's at the Texas Heart Institute in Houston, Texas. And if you if you just send me a note, you know I'll make sure you get the information and you could talk to Dr. Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery, by the way, he was at the meeting this year, and what he showed is people with severe heart failure, he was able to reverse on a monitored uh, plant-based diet, and he's got the this, this data to prove it. It's not his opinion, he has the actual facts. Next, yes? Yes, thank you for being here, Dr. Mason. I wanted to ask, if you felt that exercise is less important or equally important in preventing disease and preserving health? No, I think exercise is critical. I mean, you got to move. You got your, that's what you have joints and muscles for is to move. And so, and if, you know, you don't have to go out and lift up the gym. <laughs> you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to do that. But you do need to move. And you can do simple things. You can walk, go up and down stairs. You can do, y'all ever know how much energy you take going up and down stairs? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we used to do stairs a lot, and um, I haven't done them for a while, but, you know, we, we had stairs in my building. You know, you live in the building, go up and down the stairs, unless you, you know, always check with your physician. I always say check with your physician first, because I want y'all to be in the stairwell having a heart attack and be dead in the, in the stairwell. I said, Dr. Mason told me to do this. No, I'm not telling you that. I always check and be sure 
that you don't have any underlying problems that prevent you from doing that. Okay? Hello? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where am I going next? Up front. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the gut flora. For someone mm -hmm. who has not been plant-based and is transitioning to that uh, direction, what are your thoughts on taking a gut flora supplement until you become more plant-based? You know what? Why get the fake when you can get the real? <laughs> you know, just start eating the food. You know, I don't think, I mean, you just, you gradually, I'm not one that's really big on doing substitute things. I'm like, if you want to be, if you want to do plant-based, then you, you start doing it. And your gut flora will change on its own. I don't think that you need, and any, any of the other physicians here have any issues or any other things about that. But I know on my own journey, I never did any of that. But what I didn't do is I didn't do a radical sort of cutoff. It was gradual for me. I mean, I was a steak a day eating guy, so I knew my gut was in bad shape. So I think that you just need to do this in a in a in a in a way that makes sense, that way that that does not create any difficulty for you. You will notice some things. Some you know, when our gut flora changes, it may change the frequency of times that we pass gas. It will change the aroma of the gas that we pass. Well, I'm just saying, it doesn't smell as bad because you're not letting the gas go over putrefied meat products, which really stinks. And that's why some of y'all got sprays and all kind of stuff in your bathroom. <laughs> yeah, because can't nobody, you better like, no, don't go in there just yet. <laughs> um, I, I was going to add to that, and then somebody asked me to mention about B12. Dr. Orgain asked me, Dr. Mason, to mention about B12 before she left. Um, when I became a vegetarian, um, I did have problems with my gut and going to the bathroom. I actually became more constipated. I think in the, if you've been eating meat a long time, your gut flora are going to be messed up. And so if you, um, it, I think that taking, my personal opinion is taking a probiotic is just healthy bacteria for the gut and it'll kind of help you along and so if you want to take that in the meantime that may be something beneficial um, but I agree that if you eat a whole pl plant-based diet and you vary what you're eating you will get most of the nutrients that you need but there will be a few things that you may be deficient in one will be B12 okay most vegans will likely need to take a B12 supplement. And some may not, but some may, okay? And I think it's gonna be individualized. And so if you have to take one, it's okay. And if you don't, that's great too. I'm one of those who has to take one. And so, and it may be on how you vary your diet as well. Also too, depending on your other, um, problems you have, you may also need to take a vitamin D supplement, especially if your skin is darker. So some people may need a vitamin D supplement. Now I don't believe in, I agree with all those other supplements, you gotta take this, you gotta take that. Most you're gonna get from your food, but some things you may need like B12 and um, vitamin D for some people. Question? Back here, question? No, I just wanted to say okay. on the B12 piece. <laughs> the reason that a lot of us, our vegetables are deplete that don't have B12 is because of the, the soil. And our soils have been really sort of messed up. And that points to the other thing. You know, all the other religious groups, or many of the other religious groups, grow their own food. I mean, you think about it. The Mormons. Who else? Huh? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we really need to think about taking charge of our food supply because what we're getting, the reason why some of these supplements are necessary is because of the way that our food is grown. And it's grown in a commercial setting. And so a lot of the things that would normally be part of just the flora in the soil uh, that cre help create these, th these other things are missing. Next question. Right. 
How you doing? Um, so you spoke a lot about meat, but you didn't speak anything about seafood. So what's how? Like seafood is meat. Well, well, not exactly. Not not to my knowledge. I didn't no, know. No, seafood is meat. When you eat fish, what you're eating meat. The when bones you in the fish run down the middle of the fish, and the fish move by contracting the muscles around that. So the meat that you it's meat. It's not beef. It's not pork. It's fish, but it's still meat. It's muscle. You're still muscle. I just want you to know, it's still muscle. Now, you do whatever it is you think you like to do. I'm just telling you what it is. So, I'm not, and I'm not the anti-meat bat or the meat basher. That's not my job. My, my job is to let you know what it is that's going on. You're, you had another follow-up okay. question. So, should I not eat fish at all? Well, I'm saying that's a decision you have to make for yourself. Okay? All of us have to come to terms with what it is we want to do and when we want to do it. If you are saying that you want to become plant-based, 100% plant-based, then fish will not be a part of what you eat. Okay? But if you want to be, you know, we got all these categories. I think you'd be a pesco vegetarian or something like that. <laughs> pesca, a pes well, pesca, pesco, well, pesco, pesco something. But I'm just saying that you... If you want to be 100% plant-based, that means if it walks, hops, swims, flies, got eyes, a mama, and a daddy, you can't eat it. That's what it means. Now, anything other than that, that's up to you. And you do that in your own time. Don't let anybody rush you. You do that in your own time. And as you make the transition, you're going, as your body, which has been used to a lifetime of doing, eating other things, your body is going to rebel. It is going to rebel. And so be aware of that and keep getting yourself educated. There's a lot of stuff that's out here on good, by good people that you can read and you can see. Uh, you know, don't, I don't, I'm not a big fan of any of these people pushing any particular diet. I think, to me, of all the things to eat, plant-based is the best way, but I think that everybody needs to do it in a way that works for them. Um, and you need to do it with people who understand people that have done it, and uh, read about it. Educate yourself. There's a lot of stuff out here that you can read. Next question, or is this the right, last question? Over here, Doc, hello. Yes. Hi. Dr. Mason, thank you so much for uh, oh, coming you. and sharing your knowledge with us. Mm -hmm. One of the things I don't hear a lot that I think is very important to the African American community in particular is the impact of stress, uh, not only on diet, appetite, and the choices of foods we eat, but even the impact on the ge genetic mutation and the actual kind of new studies uh, that's talking about how it actually changes our DNA. Yes, yeah, stress is not a good thing, but we have to, you can't live without it. There are going to be times that are going to create stress. And the question isn't, is the stress bad? It's how do you handle it? And how prepared are you to handle it? Because you don't have life without stress. And so you, we have to learn how, and that's why prayer is important because it gives you that time to be quiet and to allow something to come inside, the spirit to come inside you to be able to help you with what's going with your stress. I used to say stress is the difference between your is and your want to be. Okay? It's a difference between your is and your want to be. And so what you need to do, and whatever that situation is, so I, all, I think stress management is absolutely critical. I think meditation is a good form of being able to deal with your stress, and one of the best forms of meditation is prayer. Uh, I think that, that it's important for us to understand that we all, every one of us have stress. The stress is not the problem. It's how you manage it. Yeah. And so we are living in a society that has, nowadays the, the uh, pharmaceuticals are coming directly to the people by way of television. And there, I mean, I've never even heard so many commercials about polycythemia vera on television or all of these things. So this is, this is really pushing us 
to this medical situation, which won't really help us get rid of our situation. It's a Band-Aid. And what we need to do is that understand that there's foods we can eat or drink. I mean, if you're very stressed a lot, then perhaps caffeinated things aren't good for you. Uh, but there may be some other things that are. Exercise is going to be good for you. Uh, and, and before you start an exercise program, make sure that don't go in it. Look, don't go get a membership because it's January and go to the gym and start lifting up the gym. <laughs> and you're going to get on your treadmill and do an hour. No, start slow. Build it up. And I say that for everything. If you're going to change the way you eat, because the doctor did mention that there are some problems that happen with your gut. But the best way to deal with that is to do it slowly. Give your body time to catch up. Give your body time to catch up with your mind. So just do it slowly. And your body is an amazing organism. It will make the adjustment if you just give it time. Just give it time. But don't be a, today I'm eating all the steak in the world, and tomorrow I'm not, and I'm just doing plant-based, and it's going to cut it off. I'm not saying you, you could, couldn't do that, but expect more rebellion from your body. Dr. Mason, thank you again for all your information, and I can't let you get away without asking the obvious question. Mm -hmm. Is your department prepared for studies to occur regarding the new plant-based food that is now legal? Say that, that again. That makes sense? No, say that again. Is your department prepared for any studies to take place regarding the now legalized Marijuana. To eat it? Take. Yes. It, oh, it, the so edibles? Yes, edibles and candy and things that our children might get a hold of by mistake. Right. Well, I think Thank that, you know, like any drug, like any drug, I think that if people are noticing something different that's happening, they need to be uh, tested. And there are tests that will measure the, cannab measure the cannabinoids in the bloodstream. And that's what the police are going to use if they sus suspect you're driving under the influence. Now, in terms of our department, we don't have anything specific about this yet. Obviously, we're getting guidance on what should be done. Uh, I'm not suggesting that people should run out and start smoking marijuana. You know, that's not what we're suggesting because that's going to, it is a mood altering sort of thing. It does cloud your judgment. It does do a number of things like any, many other drugs do. And so I think that we need to uh, you got to remember, this was not passed for its medicinal value. This was passed for its financial value. And so we don't expect good things necessarily to come out of it. The other thing is that we have to be very careful, and I'll say this very quickly. We have to be very careful because I saw what happened with the crack epidemic, and I saw what happened with, or what's happening with the opioids. Now, the only reason getting a lot of attention, we all know why we're getting more attention. For example, I was at a meeting and I met with the secre Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services for the, Un for the United States. And I was asking him for how, where could we apply for money for sexually transmitted infections? By the way, we have an epidemic of sexually transmitted infections right now, particularly in the black community, particularly on the south and west sides of the city and the south and west suburbs. So our department is very involved in doing that. We actually partnered with GCI to give away tickets for the big jam, and people had to come in. They had to sit for a 10-minute uh, education, and then we asked them to urinate in the cup. We're going to do a much bigger program. So I asked about money for that. He said, Terry, all I got is $10 million for the whole country. $10 million for a national epidemic. But if you want money for opioids, I can give you 10, 15, 20, 30 million dollars. Okay? And the problem that that, that that is for me is obviously the opioids are affecting one particular population a lot, and the STIs are affecting a different population. So what we have to do is be as creative as we can to get what we need to do what we need to do. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff starts at home. But the bad thing is now is because now you've got other people telling your children what they should do. And you know where they find them? They don't have to go far. No, they ain't got to go that far. 
right here. That's why they're giving phone access to anything they want. And then they've got their peers. They've got a place now to go and look at what their peers are doing. And guess what that is? It's on this too. It's called what? Snapchat. It's called Facebook, Instagram. So we as parents have a bigger job trying to help monitor and guide our children because we got all these other forces trying to raise our kids. And when we were looking at the opioid thing and, and this thing that distressed me about that is that because our department got involved, is when the people found out where the fentanyl li li uh, laced heroin was, all the addicts flocked over there. Yep. Because it's so powerfully addictive. Yep. And so we, we've, we really have to work with our children doing the best we can, and even our young adults making sure that we have open conversations about this because right now we're doing a thing, a pill back, pill take back day. And what we're doing is we're finding out the kids are getting their grandmothers, their mothers, their fathers medication out of the medicine cabinet and they're going to parties and all these kids take all the different medicines, they put them in a bowl. Right. And these kids are taking whatever they take out in the bowl and they're drinking it and mixing it with cough syrup and other kinds of things. Right. So it's, there's a lot going on, and you could say that's horrible and everything else, but you better know what your kids are doing. And then, you know, in God we trust, all others we test. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to know, I, got, I suffer from real bad asthma, and I wanted to know what type of plant-based food can I take or eat or whatever to make me breathe better besides exercising. Yeah, I don't have a, a cornucopia of medication, of particular foods that you eat. You can't think of the food as medicine because, see, the way medicines work, and I'll make this the last question, um, the way medicines work, the way medicines work is this. Medicines look at one pathway and then they come up with something that alters that pathway and therefore alters the path of the, the disease. But that's not the way foods work. Foods don't work with one pathway. You can't take this for that specifically. When you eat a piece of Swiss chard or some, some um, bok choy or what have you, it's not just gonna do one thing. It's going to do a number of things to help you. So don't think of foods like medicine. Can I take this for that? No, you eat foods, you eat plants, and you'll get more than just that. You'll get a bunch of other things. But it won't be something like a medication. We can't think of foods like medicine. That's why I stopped using in all of my presentations. Hey, Sadaki. I stopped using in all my presentations and everything that I ever talked about where it said food is medicine. Because the truth is, the right foods, you won't need medicine. So that's, forget about thinking of food that way. Because when you eat the food, it's not gonna just, food is not just gonna help lower your, I mean, we'll do one thing. It'll help lower your blood pressure. It'll help lower your cholesterol. It'll help lower your likelihood of developing more inflammation. It causes all of these other problems. So that's, we gotta change the way we think about this because it's not correct. And we've been so contaminated by the medical industry, and I, you know, and I'm not, I'm afra not afraid to say it, we've been so contaminated that we th try to think of food like med medicine. No, don't do that, okay? Don't do that. When you, th when you eat food, you're gonna get a number of benefits all at the same time. Where's the last question? Okay, you guys have been amazing. Thank you so much. And I want our pastor, I think you need to give your pastor a hand because the pastor, as the leader of this flock, is entrusted with your spiritual health. But you ain't gonna have no spirit if you ain't got no body. So <laughs> you got to have good physical health as well. Pastor, I thank you so much, and I now yield your pulpit back to you. 
Again, I'm going to turn it to Dr. Wells, but can we just celebrate and appreciate the information and the knowledge that we gain on this evening? We thank you, Dr. Mason. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So very much. And thank Oh, uh, absolutely. Every, <laughs> Dr. Christina Wells, our health ministry director here at Shiloh, let's give her a round of applause for her as well. We are thankful and grateful. I, I know you guys have so, so many questions, and we knew that this type of event would, um, would cause you to be no, want to know more about your health. Um, this was just the scratch of the surface. So uh, one, I want to thank you guys for coming out. I have a few things that I wanted to um, share with you. One, I wanted to, um, you know, before we do that, I, I talked to you guys before I thank everyone. Earlier today, I mentioned that we're going to be doing some vegan vegetarian cooking classes. And they're going to be starting. So if you want to know how to eat, then come to these classes. If you want the answers to some of the questions, well, how do I put this together? What food should I be eating? That's where you're gonna get some more of these answers. So I'm gonna, one, have a sign-up sheet outside. So see me afterwards for two things. One, if you want to sign up for the cooking classes, then sign up for those. And also, we're gonna be having programs throughout the year here. So if you want more information about out. our programs that we'll be having throughout the year, sign up and I will email you when those programs are occurring. Now our, Feb our cooking classes are going to be February the 9th, February the 23rd, and March the 1st. They're going to be, those are Sunday afternoons, they're going to be from 2 to 4 p.m. next door in our parish hall. And we are partnering with Chef T from Majani Restaurant, who is joining us here tonight. And I'm going to allow him a few minutes to say a few words about um, whatever he wants to say about, about the restaurant or whatever. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I, I'm all, I've been a fan. Dr. Uh, Mason has, you know, he was my urologist years ago when he was, you know, still practicing. But um, I was raised Seventh-day Adventist. You know, my family uh, was raised in the Seventh-day Adventist church, and that is the background. Without that, I would not, I don't think I would have became a vegan. So, um, you know, from that I became an Israelite, Hebrew Israelite, but that's what took me the rest of the way. But my foundation was in the, the, the Adventist church. And so uh, I was fortunate my father never brought pork into the house. You know, we had fish and chicken on occasion, but mostly it was beans and rice coming up. So I'm grateful for that upbringing. And, and uh, it was that what gave me the roots to really want to bring healthy eating into communities that didn't have those options. And what was passionate for me to create um, restaurants along the way uh, leading up to Majani and create community gardens where we could teach healthy eating classes. So it's part of, it's part of our, my ministry to, to teach healthy eating and to bring possibilities of what that looks like, what it tastes like, and what it feels like to, to be on a vegan diet. I became a vegan December 1st. 1981, so I've been on the path for a long time, and uh, our goal is to, thank you, our goal is to, um, is to, to nourish and educate and heal communities by, by creative and innovative uh, vegan cuisine. So we look forward to spending Sunday afternoon with you guys, and I see a lot of folks here that have been to our restaurant, uh, and so we're, we're appreciative of that. And, uh, you know, longtime pioneers like Kay Stepkin, who's uh, been at it for longer than I have, so uh, 50 years longer than me, so. Uh, so I just wanted to say a few words, uh, you know, I don't know if I can plug or should plug uh, our restaurant. For those of you that are looking for some ready-made alternatives now as you make the transition, if you're transitioning, uh, we have two restaurants, one at uh, 71, 67 South Exchange Avenue in South Shore Community, and uh, we just opened up our second location. Uh, in Pullman, in Pullman community at uh, 756 East 111th Street. So we look forward to seeing you there as well as seeing you here on Sunday. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. I
just, I just wanted to just put that plug in. You know, you know, two two years ago, Pastor Marlon uh, Reed, I preached about that. I said I went to one of the best restaurants on the face of the planet, and I couldn't remember the name of it, but you all knew it. And I just want to testify that you all need to frequent and visit Majani's. It is absolutely phenomenal. You need to get there as soon as possible. If you've not been there, make sure you get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yes, they have awesome food. They're um, barbecue cauliflower. It's not healthy, though, but it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's relative. Maybe he'll bake it one day instead of deep frying it. <laughs> All right, so as we wrap up here, um, because we knew we couldn't put everything in one evening. Again, if you want more information, if you want to sign up for our cooking classes, please see me afterwards. I want to thank Pastor Lee and the Shiloh Church for allowing us to have this tonight. Um, I want to thank Kay Septon um, and Carmelita Banks and um, the National Vegan Mes uh, Vegetarian Mes Museum that has been at this church for the last month. Um, I wanted to thank a couple people, but they had left already. Dr. O'Kane, my former boss, and Dr. Walker, who came here from Hinsdale. I thank you guys for coming out tonight. Um, I, I want to end by saying this, um, and I started off with this in saying that we truly here believe